This is about the power of God being present in your world to bring healing, deliverance, freedom, to reshape your circumstances. We're going to go to Mark chapter 2 and verse 1. And this story about a paralyzed man who was stuck in life needed four friends to help him get into the presence of God. Mark chapter 2 says, And again Jesus entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together. If Jesus is in church, it's a very magnetic force. People are attracted to the church that has Jesus, his presence right in the center. Many gathered to the door so that there was no longer any room for them to receive him, not even near the door. So there's a big crowd overflowing both in the house and beyond because Jesus was in the house. And then they came to him bringing a paralytic who's carried by four men. This is amazing because most people find it very difficult to come to church or to get into the presence of God unless some friends bring them. I was brought to church because of a friend who reached out to me. Even Peter, Andrew's brother in the Bible, came to Jesus because Andrew reached out to him. Generally, people come because we ask them, how good is Psalm 122? Where it says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. How many people would be glad today if somebody, and not just somebody, but some team of people, like they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. That isn't like saying, here's an invitation. Come to church at 9 a.m. tomorrow. We, we have a great time. No, they didn't say go to church. They said, let us go to church. They said, we'll come pick you up. And it wasn't just one person saying, I'll come and pick you up. It says, we, they said to me, let's go. It's always better to go with a group of people. And so this is one form of evangelism, I guess, or reaching out and winning lost people to Christ that we ignore, thinking it's just got to be this one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction with a person. But sometimes it's better if you invite a person into a small group and they come together with the love and the grace of God. And if Jesus is in that place, he's very magnetic. When we put dogma or doctrine or denominations or Christian heritage in the middle of, the, of what the church is all about, there's nothing attractive about that. Jesus, there's something about him that virtually no one on earth will refuse. And when he was here on earth, mothers would bring their children, fathers would come, great crowds would gather, but even his enemies found him irresistible. The scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they turned up at this meeting. It says, immediately many gathered together and he preached the word to them. People, this is awesome. He didn't just preach opinions to them. He didn't preach his own agenda to them. He didn't preach his vision to them. He preached the word. Preachers, that's what we are meant to do. As servants of God, we serve him by preaching his word. It's not us who can build the church. He builds the church and we labor in vain unless the Lord builds the house. The fact is, even Jesus preached scripture. He preached the word of God because there's power in what is written. Way more power than we can even guess that is happening. When we preach the word, how, how tragic it is, is it when, when you listen to a message and you, you don't even hear a scripture. You hear maybe a slight reference here and there to it. Honestly, we are called to preach the word. Peter said that. Paul said that. He said, we preach the word of faith. He's, and he constantly quotes scripture. Just read the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew. It's quoting scripture after scripture after scripture out of the Old Testament saying this was confirmed. We serve the scripture. We are to preach the word. And Jesus did that. And said, he preached the word to them. Then they came to him. That was these four guys bringing a man stuck. He couldn't take steps. Indecisive, you might say. 
all kinds of problems why people won't move forward in life, why they've lost momentum. They're, they're in a state of complete inertia. They've stopped and they're stuck and they can't move. We should not judge people like that. We should reach out to them and pick them up. And often the, the very same handles that we can put people down with are the same handles we can actually pick them up and carry them with. And so what is a wound or a, a hurt or a misunderstood area of a person's life often can be judged so easily. People can say, well, why are they doing that? They're, they're terrible people. That's not us. No, we, we want to say, we don't understand why they're behaving like that. Who knows what's happened to them? Let's pick them up. Say, we love you anyway. And, and carry them. And it's good that there's four guys who are moving in unity, right? A team that's moving in the same direction with the same ambition to achieve the same result. That's harmony. Where there's harmony, there's growth, there's increase, there's power, there's authority. Where there's agreement, where there's unity, that's the place of power. These guys were united. You didn't have a guy on the back trying to walk the other way, which is a picture of a lot of kind of co church committees. You got the lead guy wanting to go that way. This guy wants to go that way. And some guy wants to go the other way. Let's say yes and amen and get an agreement, pursue unity, and we can carry people into the presence of God like these guys did. And they all got involved. They didn't slack off on what part they were meant to play. The guy at the back dropped his handle. The, our, our friend who's going to be in the presence of Jesus, he just slides right off. And when the whole church is doing their part, not just leaving it to a few dedicated volunteers who are wearing themselves out, but actually the whole church gets mobilized, understanding that if they were to commit and, and do their part, then we are carrying people into the presence of the Lord each week. The people who welcome at church, the people in the car park, the people who are at the cafe, the people who are following up decisions on that Sunday, the people who are mopping the floors or cleaning the toilets. Everybody is moving together towards achieving that amazing result of people feeling they were welcomed, they're at home, they have a place to come. And that's what these guys were doing. They were working together like a very effective team. And when they could not come near, and here's an interesting thing, you know, it says many people were gathered there, exactly. Many people were gathered there. It also says many doctors, professors of the law were gathered and the power of, the, of God was present to heal them. It says that in Luke 5, 17. So this is saying that the power of God was present to heal those guys, these religious leaders. They had, I don't know, might have been, a, suffering from arthritis, rheumatism, respiratory problems, tumors, whatever. They had, they had need of healing. But you know, the, the tragic story of this, this story, the tragic part of the story is they didn't get healed. But this guy that these people are carrying, these friends, yeah, he did. So let's, let's follow that story. When they could not come near Jesus because of the crowd, Honestly, there's, there's always a lot of reasons why people won't come to Christ. I mean, even, even Christians, even us, coming to Christ on a daily basis means I come to Him in prayer. I come to Him with worship. I come to Him to fight off the devil and to, to draw near to the presence of God and draw His presence into my life and into our church and into our families. But there's always a reason. There's a crowd of distractions whether it's in our devices or if it's other things we just feel like we have to do. Don't let anything distract you. Don't let any crowd of problems, answers, solutions, dreams, anything stop you from actually connecting with Christ, especially if we're bringing someone. We just, we just don't give up. We don't, we don't give up and, and walk away. We, we say, oh, we can't do it. One of those guys was a faith man. He was a faith leader. At least one of them was. He said, there's always a way. We'll find a way to bring our friend into the presence of God. And I've always found that when a miracle is about to happen, there is opposition. There are definite obstacles to achieving what you're trying to achieve. There's going to be pushback. And that, 
That was the problem here. They, they arrived late because they'd been off finding a stretcher, finding their friend, getting their team together. And all the crowd had already gathered and they thought, oh, like, don't come here, guys. We're not going to let you in. So they did something very innovative. When they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And so when they'd broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. So they went up to break down through the roof to get into the presence of God. They thought, we're going to make it through here. We're going to get our friend healed. They had faith. If we can just get him in the presence of God, he's going to get healed. And they were correct. And so they climb up on the roof, start pulling away the tiles. They do something radical. Faith does something radical, even ridiculous sometimes. But there's many times the ridiculous leads to the miraculous. Shouting at a wall seems ridiculous. But then the miracle happens that brings down the walls. Taking five smooth stones to slay a giant seems ridiculous, but it released the miraculous. Stepping out of a boat, casting your net over that side, burrowing pots, filling water pots with water. All of these things can seem at the time unusual, ridiculous. Why am I doing this? But if you're bold and you push through, that courage often gets rewarded in a miraculous way. If not in a miraculous way, I can guarantee you it gets rewarded. And, uh, and, and then they let him down on his bed right in front of Jesus. And in verse five, it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, the man stuck, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now the translation, man, your sins are forgiven you. Well, this is unusual. Wasn't, was it, wasn't the boy brought to Jesus for healing? But now Jesus is saying, son, your sins are forgiven you. Because oftentimes our sins and our sicknesses are entwined. Sometimes we've done something wrong. We've done something really bad and it's actually affected our physical life and we need forgiveness. Forgiveness and healing go hand in hand. You know, there are times when it's not just receiving forgiveness, it's giving forgiveness that brings healing into our lives. I, I know people who are bound up with, with rheumatism and arthritis and, and they refuse to forgive that person who, who did them wrong 30 years ago or whatever, but they're not getting over it. They carry that grudge. And it can be seem almost unjust to let it go because I'm forgiving, the, I'm the victim. They should be punished, but this is how Jesus did it on the cross. He was the victim. They crucified him and he said, I forgive them. And that is a huge key in this life to living in health, not just freedom, because when you forgive, you get set free. But when we receive forgiveness, Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven you. Take up your bed and walk. Now, the two go together. Forgiveness and freedom, forgiveness and healing come into our life. When Jesus died on the cross, he atoned for our sins and carried our sicknesses, both in the same action. And he delivered us from devils. It says he disarmed every devil that has power over people's lives, tormenting them in all kinds of ways, harassing them and, and it, it, enslaving their soul. So they're manipulated by forces that are stronger than themselves. They do things they don't want to do. But Jesus came to set us all free from those powers. And through the cross, he achieved all of that. And so when he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. <sighs> now, these critics <laughs> the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they said, who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, that's true. And that was God right there in front of them, forgiving sins. So they missed that point completely. But Jesus knew what they were thinking. It's kind of spooky when there's somebody nearby who knows exactly what your thoughts are. And he says to them, it says in verse 8, 
uh, or let's go back to the scripture where it says, your sins are forgiven you. And then in verse six, some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. They said, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned like this in themselves, he said to them, so they're thinking inside, thinking, how can this guy be doing that? But he answers their thoughts. So that's a shock. When somebody answers what you're thinking on the inside. He says, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you or rise up and walk? He says, but you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. You know I've got the power to forgive sins because the effect of sins on this man's life, making him paralyzed, is going to be broken. So he wouldn't be able to walk if his sins weren't forgiven. So you're going to see that I have that power to forgive sins. And then he said to the paralytic, I said to you, rise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he arose and he took up his bed and he went out in the presence of them all so that they were all amazed, glorified God. Amazing. You know, uh, so many of us get stuck in life like this guy. I mean, maybe not physically, but emotionally, mentally, in our decisions moving forward but the fact is you and I can have friends with us and be in a group of supportive communities like the church is and we can find that there are moments when we can't walk and we've got others to carry us there are moments where we can't take a step and they help us make a decision but more more than anything else the best friends you can have in this life are people who help you come into the presence the presence of Jesus. And so I pray that right now you will feel His presence right there in your room. And I, I wanna pray for you that the power of heaven will touch your life in the name of Jesus right now, that healing would come into your, whatever, whatever part of your life that you're reaching out to God for, healing in your body, in your lungs, in your stomach, in your head, in your eyes, in your ears, in your mouth, teeth, in your muscles, in your joints, healing from the hand of God comes right now because He forgives you and He sets you free and all is forgiven. You're okay. You're all right with Him now because you've asked Jesus into your life. So God bless you. I look forward to talking again soon. Make sure you hit subscribe. Reach out and grab any of our books. They're going to help you. Look forward to talking again soon. God bless you.